Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Good morning, Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. My name is Ruben Nava. I'm a one man car today. My partner Jesse is uh, out uh, doing some apostolic work. As you know, Jesse, just about every weekend, he's out preaching all over the country. So uh, continue to keep him in your prayers. He's doing the Lord's work out there. And so, Jesse, arrive home safely. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, a must-see movie for Lent. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to uh, the the journal Aletheia. Um, um, it's a Greek word. Um, and uh, they, they put out some good stuff. We use a lot of their material here on the show. And and they, there's an article that they they have uh, posted about a movie. And uh, they actually talked to the the actual person. It is a true life story. And we'll get into that. And later on the show, I'm going to be highlighting um, an article from a, a first responder. I'm going to give him kudos, uh, a police officer that he also writes for... Uh, that magazine that I just, or that uh, journal that I just mentioned. Um, and he, and it's, I just want to give him some props and, and we need more first responders like him out there. So, but, uh, so I'm, I'm 10, eight, um, open for calls. I'm going to give you some, um, uh, some Intel on, on marriage, because that's what this movie is all about. It's about marriage. It's about suffering. It's about, uh, denying ourselves. And, uh, so, Everything that the church teaches, um, and this movie is not a, uh, it's not a Catholic movie per se. This is actually a, a, a Christian couple, but um, just a, as you may have seen the movie, I can only imagine it's it's produced by the same people. And this one here, it's a, it's a movie called I Still Believe, um, and so it's a story by uh, Jeremy Camp. Now I, I had never heard of Jeremy Camp. Uh, uh, I guess. In the worship circles of music, Christian music, he's a very popular, one of the big names out there. But the uh, movie is a biopic uh, of a tragic romance that uh, will leave viewers full of hope. So the uh, long-awaited biopic on the life of Christian music artist Jeremy Camp, it's scheduled to be released this weekend on March 13th. The film centers around the real-life story of the adorable romance between Camp and his wife, Melissa who met in college and quickly became smitten with each other. Uh, many uh, relationships are are fostered in college, you know, when uh, our kids go away. And uh, this was no different. And as I mentioned, this is produced by the same individuals, Andrew and John Irwin, uh, who pr- produced, I can only imagine, in 2018. So the movie's full of religious uh, themes like hope, unconditional love, Grief, doubt, and the renewal of faith. So that's not uh, limit to, limited to uh, just our our Catholic faith. Our Christian brothers they have produced some some good material, and and it's a, a family show. So let's get into it. Uh, Jeremy and Melissa's relationship, which uh, grew slowly, was based on on shared interests and a and a mutual faith. Melissa's devoutness, her good nature, inspired Camp. You know, he was beginning his journey to become one of the most prolific Christian musicians of this generation. And uh, it should be noted, though, um, that, well, the story is, is of, a, of a musician. It, the music kind of takes a back seat to the plot, which is mostly around, around resol- revolves around budding romance. Anyway, their, their love for one another grew, blossomed, and when Melissa was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, rather than break off the relationship, however, Camp proposed that uh, he stayed by her side throughout every moment of her arduous illness. So the film shows the hardships they endured as the two young lovers did their best to make the most out of every moment they had left together. Oh, so my question is to you, what would you do when faced with the uncertainty of living without your spouse? What kind of things would you you know, put on your bucket list? And, uh, or, or there's, you know, we know many uh, young people that will 
would get discouraged and, and walk away. And, you know, I want somebody healthy. You know, I'm not going to spend my days in the hospital with, you know, what, what is she going to do for me? She's not going to be around much longer. Uh, that happens. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, that plays out. Some people are very selfish. Uh, it, the article goes on to say that um, Camp, he was he's played by Riverdale's KJ Appa, that brought Melissa, who's been played by Britt Robertson, everywhere he performed. So he took her to all his shows. He would ask his audience to pray over her every chance he got. There's one there's one point where Melissa seems like she might have beaten the illness, but while this is a brief time afforded them a chance to take their wedding vows, it was not to last. And I, I know kind of giving you given giving it away, but the illness eventually returned to claim Melissa's life. So think back on your relationships. Do we build each other up? Do we pray as a couple? Uh, are we praying with each other and for each other? That's what this couple was doing. It was in the grips of grief that he'd never known and n- never previously known. And Camp went to his father, you know, played by Gary Sinise. And uh, Gary Sinise is that is that actor that perhaps best known for playing Lieutenant Dan in the uh, 1994 movie Forrest Gump. And he and by the way, he he became a Catholic um, in 2010. Uh, Gary Sinise, a real good man. He gives a, a lot of time to uh, wounded warriors and, and the military that come back from with injuries. So that was the he's playing uh, Camp's father. Camp's faith in in lay matters replaced by furious doubt until he finds Melissa's journals. So after Melissa's di- you know he's he's going through this turmoil. He's going through this losing his wife. He's he's going to his dad to to help him deal with this. And it wasn't until he found Melissa's journals, and uh, which she never allowed him to read. So. You know, sometimes at this point, people in relationships, you know, are even in other walks of life, when, when tragedy strikes them, right there where the rubber meets the road, we find out what they're made of, what their faith is made of, you know, and, and many people start blaming God when they lose a loved one. You know, asking him, you know, why did my spouse have to suffer or why did my child have to suffer? But as Catholics, we need only to look to the cross. Our Lord didn't deserve to die either, but, you know, he came to die for us. As, um, you know, Dr. Scott Hahn uh, likes to say, he came to pay a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. I'll say that again. He, he came to pay a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And uh, so finally reading the journal, Camp was uh, reminded of his deceased wife's unique perspective on life. And it was revealed that through the pain of the illness and the grueling rounds of treatment, Melissa's faith was, was never swayed. She always trusted that her pain served a purpose and her words helped bring Camp back to himself. It was in her letter to him that Camp found the inspiration to write the song, I Still Believe, which endures as one of the most popular songs. Um, it's fitting that the movie is set to come out during the season of Lent as it's remarkably faithful story. Uh, Jeremy went through a sort of passion all his own as he's willingly stood by Melissa's side through one of the most harrowing situations two young people could go through. And I'm sure this movie is going to bring tears to you um, and the viewers that uh, that watch it. So they're just as sure to leave the theater filled with hope and and inspired by the real faiths of the people in the true story. You know, he, uh, they asked, uh, camp how he got into, uh, you know, into music. And he says his dad, you know, bought, you know, bought him a guitar. And when he was young, I think 14 years old, uh, it was a gift his dad, uh, gave him. And, uh, he says, I didn't know what it entailed. I just knew that I was able to write my heart down through song. Going to college, started playing different places, and you know. So God, he said, "Okay, God, I think you're opening doors for me to play music," and that's what Jeremy Camp did. He he started going all around the country and and, and playing at different venues. And he says it was kind of an obvious thing, not a thing where I was pursuing or pushing. It was just him, him, God opening doors. So I think that's the great thing about 
uh, our Lord to help. Let him do it. Don't push the doors open, he said. I think that's what, for me, was so encouraging because I realized that I'm walking on his in his steps, not my own. So how often do we... Uh, do we let God lead the way? You know, do we, how do we, do we ask the Holy Spirit each morning to direct our paths, to, to put people in our path, to bring people to us? Uh, that's always been my, my daily prayer. Lord, bring me people that I could speak to about you. And, um, and sure enough, he accommodates me. Um, getting back to the article, he's, uh, Jeremy Kemp said they met at a Bible study. And um, he says his dad was a pastor and uh he he thinks uh he says i think the song is is about things that i really wrestled with he wrote a song called this man and uh the hard time of understanding why jesus would do that he says i i was thinking i don't deserve it at all why would he die for me and for the whole world i'm i'm kind of a thinker he says so i went through this whole wrestle of why because he did nothing wrong because you know jesus did nothing wrong and so jeremy's asking you know why did jesus have to have to die then it's like would i do that and would i play this pay this price for someone and i was like if i were he would i have died for him i guess you're right for someone as young as to have these questions a lot but for me it was a moment of willingness to give yourself and the whole song is just asking are you willing to surrender at all are we willing to surrender folks uh giving it all to god we pick up on the other side of the break. We're going to get into this, and we're going to we're going to talk about another story that you want to hear. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter ten, "Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me." According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church, to aid and defend her. How does the baby eat? Can the baby hear me? How did the baby get in there? Wow, a pregnancy can sure generate a lot of questions, but what's important is that a baby is a baby, inside and out of the womb, not just after birth, but nine months before, at conception. That's right, every baby is a miracle. Hello, my name is Marianne Kuharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org or better yet, simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the key word pro-life. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. A baby's heart is beating 18 days from conception. Pro-Life Across America. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I'm a one-man car. My partner's out doing apostolic work. And uh, we're talking today about uh, about marriage. In, in fact, uh, it... Um, Talking about a movie, it's I still believe it's a it's been tabbed as a must see for Lent. It's a it's a Protestant based, but uh, 
It uh, has a, a lot of good themes in it that you may want to see. It's a family show. And uh, we're talking about the, it's about a Jeremy Camp who is, a, I guess, a pro- prolific uh, Protestant uh, singer. He plays Christian music. And uh, about his wife, he and his wife took ill with ovarian cancer. And uh, he stayed by her side and, and uh, through it all thick and thin, you know, she eventually passed away. And it's the story of uh, of his life and their life together. And so they're, uh, the um, the journal Alicia is uh, is questioning him about about the movie, um, the real Jeremy Camp, and uh, they ask him uh, throughout Melissa's illness. The movie showed you crowdsourcing prayers from every Christian community that you performed for. How did this show of support help you and Melissa through the ordeal? And so he said it was huge. He said I I would have have people praying at concerts, have people praying at interviews. It was massive. That's the the best part of people coming together. It helped us to continue to walk through this trial. And, um, you know, in our, in our lives, you know, oftentimes, you know, when uh, someone is sick here at the network, we have you good folks out there listening, our listeners to be our network, to, to be our prayer chain, to be our prayer warriors. And, uh, we too here at the station are praying for you in your time of distress and your time of need. We should all be praying for each other. And, um, you know, it just it reminds me how, um, you know, in First Corinthians thirteen four to, through seven, it's it's the most read verse I think at uh, at weddings. Um, everybody I'm sure is familiar with this, but it's good to to ref- refresh our, our memory about this. That you know, love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not not self seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. And those of you who are married, you know that it's it, when marriage is going good, it's great. It's the best thing in the world. When it's going bad, it's real bad. So, uh, unfortunately, people think that, well, you know, I'm giving 50% and she has got to give 50%, but... No, you got you. You both got to give one hundred and ten percent. You know, you've got you both got to give. You give what till it hurts, and um, even when you don't want to, that's what this verse is all about. It, it's it's not envious. You know, it doesn't boast. It's not proud. You're seeking the good of the other person. You know, and and uh, you, we should be going out of our way to to treat our spouses better each day. Um. So. They ask. They also ask him a question um, that after Melissa passed away, your character expressed anger at God and asked your father, and and you asked your father why. How did you pull yourself out of the moment of doubt? And he said that one thing he learned about questions is that it's okay to ask God, and you know, okay to ask them. God's okay with that. Think of Jesus on the cross, and uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There wasn't anything wrong with that. It was just a, re- a question. Um, what's happening right now? Um, but we, uh, but we do really know uh, as Catholics what it means. It's it's Jesus is is just Jesus despairing on the cross, or is he rather pointing to the end of the psalm where where hope and praise are expressed? At Psalm twenty two, this cry to God should not be confused with despair. Jesus is not in despairing. Okay, in despair we give up on our relationship to God and let it go. Um, so I'm just pointing out when he's on this verse, he's he's Jesus' words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, so for the psalmist, that, that relationship has been foundational. Uh, in fact, his enemies mock him precisely because he has been faithful to God. And it is this bond of trust in God that that the scoffers try to undermine. So Jesus was not in despair when he... But in his human nature, you know, he, he, you know, he was hurting. Um, so it goes on in the article. Now, we have to be careful as not to go against God in our questioning. He, Camp is saying that I think it's okay to say, God, I don't understand this. This hurts. And it is. God's a, a big God, you know, he, with a big G. So you shouldn't be afraid to say those things. You know, he's big enough to take care of those things. And sometimes you may see how God is using this or that. I think that uh, being able to ask questions is important. You have to have that freedom, but don't stay there. It's a good point. He's saying uh, what I always tell people is don't stay in those questions. 
Jesus asks, why have you forsaken me? But he also goes, into your hands I commend my spirit. So basically, that he surrenders. I think uh, I think he says that uh, we're, we always have to land that I might not understand, but I trust him. And we do. We have to trust in Jesus. My Jesus, I trust in you. Um, that's He says, that's for me the whole song I still believe was I don't understand and I have questions, but I still believe in your faithfulness. It's just like when we go to Holy Communion. Um, we, we don't fully understand the transubstantiation. We have faith in, because Jesus said it. You know, this is my body. This is my blood. And he will raise us up on the last day, who, who, he who partakes of it. And so we trust in Jesus' words for us and his faithfulness to us. And so, uh, you know, when we look back on this movie, you you see that uh, Melissa, his wife, was suffering. She was suffering, and, and in a sense, she was um, offering her sufferings, too, for, for her husband, even though typically Protestants don't... Um, don't preach that. Um, a verse that all Catholics need to know is, is Colossians one twenty four. St. Paul says, I, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. And it has to be explained that we're not saying Jesus was lacking anything but his body is his body. The church is lacking. So we're praying with our sufferings. We're offering our sufferings for the redemption and, and the, you know, for our, our priests, our bishops, you know, our family members, those in the church, those are suffer the suffering souls in purgatory. So that's a little bit what the movie's about, but let's talk about what, what dying to self is because that's, that's what happens in a marriage. You have to die to yourself. And in short, it just means dying uh, to our own desires and trusting God that that God has what's best for us. And, and as our Lord conveys when he says, then Jesus told his apostles, disciples, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? Matthew sixteen twenty four to 26. So the failure to, to die to themselves and, and trust in God led Adam and Eve's original sin. It's the root of all sin in, in one way or another. You know, so sometimes um, in seeking God's will for our lives, we were brought low so that we can learn to be more trusting. You're more trusting of God. You know, you can, you can look at 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 8 through 10, or Romans 8, 28. So here we're reminded that being childlike, you know, radically, radically trusting and not childish, uh, immature and self-centered is at the heart of being God's faithful disciple. And you can uh, see what Matthew uh, 19, 14, or Luke 18, 16. So radically trusting and not being that immature child, you know, and just crying for our own, our own ways, you know. It it also, we we should uh, remind ourselves that, you know, suffering, like First Peter 5.10 says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, Christ has gone ahead of us to prepare a, a place for us. He tells us so. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. So, dying to ourselves, we have to die to ourselves in order to live in Christ. And this command uh, for Christian, uh, for the Christian by Jesus seems quite radical and yet contradictory. How can we gain life by losing it? With a little bit of logic, however, we can find that it's not a contradiction, but rather a paradox. Two things that seem contradictory, but are actually true. So Christianity is the religion of paradox. That God would be human. That life comes from death. That achievement comes through failure. That 
folly is wisdom and happiness is to mourn, that to find one must lose, one must lose, and that the greatest are the smallest. What is paradoxical about the mysteries of the faith is that reason cannot fully penetrate their meaning. So that what seems contradictory to reason is profoundly true in terms of uh, faith. It is when we understand this notion of paradox that at the same time, there are some things beyond human reason that we ought to put our faith in God, that we can really understand what it means to die to self. You know, so we see in modern society, this is often not the case, people giving in daily to their passions, sinful behavior, greed, avarice, and homosexuality. Even things like abortion are not uncommon for most people. Fear the loss of a possibility of a career if a baby should happen to come their way. And this is the result of a lack of faith in God's divine providence. It's not only in sin, though we we fail to carry our crosses, but also in not practicing temperance and penance and abstinence and the like. And that's what Lent is all about, doing all those things, practicing temperance, penance, abstinence. We fail to carry our crosses. You know, Father George Leo Haydock in his Haydock commentary states, the two ways in which we are to carry our crosses. There are two kinds of crosses which our Savior here commands us to take up, one corporal and the other spiritual. By the former, he commands us to restrain the unruly appetites of the touch, taste, sight, etc. By the other, which is far more worthy, our notice, he teaches us to govern the affections of the mind and restrain all its irregular motions by humility, tranquility, modesty, and peace. And uh, he goes on to say that Jesus thus reminds us to deny ourselves not only from that which is morally bad, such as sin, which we should always avoid, of course, but even from genuinely good things, such as when we abstain or fast from food, water, or sleep. Not because these things, such as food and water, are bad, but that by sacrificing and giving these goods up, we get the greatest good in return, namely God and Christ. But if we, but if, if he continues moderately happy as to temporal concerns till death and places his affections on them, he hath found life here, but shall lose it in the next world. But if he that shall, for the sake of Christ, deprive himself of the pleasures of this life, shall receive the reward of a hundredfold in the next. All right. That's a, that's a wrap on that, but we want to, I just want to mention a story when we come back about what Bishop Fulton Sheen talked about, a similar story. You don't want to miss it. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies, featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Carstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today. For Adoramus at the Triduum. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. We are 10-8. We are, um, well, it's just me today, folks. Um, I was talking about a, a movie, a Christian movie that's coming out this this weekend, and um, it's recommended. And it's, uh, But I, I want to tell a, a one of my favorite stories of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, and, and most of you listeners, I know that you're a, a fan of his. I know Terry really is a, a, a big, as I am, a big Fulton Sheen uh, admirer. And uh, Fulton Sheen talks about a story that just at the turn of the century, last century, okay, in 1900s, uh, there was a woman married in Paris, he, and just a, a good, ordinary Catholic girl to an atheistic doctor, Dr. Felix Le Sueur. He attempted to break her down, break down the faith of his wife, and she reacted by studying her faith. And she she collected books. She she he was building up his library of his uh, atheistic books, and so she started building her own library uh, to 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 be able to calm, you know do some apologetics with him to you know counter, counteract what he was saying. And so. Uh, in 1905, she was taken ill and tossed on a bed of constant pain until August 1914. When she was dying, she said to her husband, Felix, when I'm dead, you will become a Catholic and a Dominican priest. Elizabeth, uh, you know my sentiments. I've sworn hatred of God, he says. I shall live in the hatred and I shall die in it. So she repeated her words and passed away. She died in her husband's arms at the, at the early age of 47. And then later on, when um, Dr. Felix was rummaging through her papers, he found her will, and she wrote, In 1905, I asked Almighty God to send me sufficient sufferings to purchase your soul. On the day that I die, the price will have been paid. Greater love than this, no woman, than, ha- than she who lays down her life for her husband. Dr. Lesur, the atheist, dismissed her, her will as the fancies of a pious woman. He decided to write a book against Lourdes, and so he went down to Lourdes to write against Our Lady. So, however, as he looked up into the face of the statue of Mary, he received the great gift of faith. So total, so complete was it that he was never he never had to go through the process of juxtaposition and say, how will I answer this or that difficulty? It was almost a St. Paul moment, you know, on the road to Damascus. He saw it all at once. The then reigning pontiff was Benedict XV. Then came World War I. Hearing of the conversion of Dr. Le Sur, uh Pope Benedict XV sent for him, and Dr. Le Sur went to the comp- went in the company of Father James John Vinea, orator of Notre Dame. Dr. Le Sur, uh recounted his conversion and said that he wanted to become a Dominican priest. Holy Father said, I forbid you. You must remain in the world and repair the harm you have done. And then the Holy Father then talked to Father Vinaya and uh, then again to Dr. Lesur and said, I revoke my decision. Whatever Dr. Father Vinaya tells you to do, you may do. So in the year 1924, during Lent, Fulton Sheen says, I, Fulton J. Sheen, made my retreat in the Dominican Monastery in Belgium. Four times each day and 45 minutes in length, I made my retreat under the spiritual guidance of Father Felix Lisieux of the Order of Preachers, Catholic Dominican priest, who told me this story. And isn't that amazing? Um, the dying to self, that's, she died for her, her beloved. And it, it caused his conversions. And she she wrote she penned this letter Elizabeth his wife penned this letter, 
and I'll, it's just a, a paragraph I'll read it to you. It says, the gift of self, not only in fulfilling my responsibilities to everyone, not only in charitable work, not only in prayer, but in my whole attitude and way of life. Great and holy ideas and deep convictions often influence others only through the attractiveness of those who embody them. You will know them by their fruits, Matthew seven sixteen. Our Savior said, by the fruits of devotion, charity, and radiant faith, and also by those blossoms that first attract notice and precede the fruit. Those are called tender love, graciousness, social refinement, serenity, equanimity, friendliness, joy, and simplicity. A truly holy person, mistress by divine grace of her body and its challenges, without ever speaking, exudes the delicate perfume of these flowers. Such a person person attracts others by her gentle influence and prepares them for God's approach, which she eventually obtains for them through her prayers. Signed, Elizabeth Lesseur. Beautiful words. Uh, she's she's basically saying that by your example, by the way you carry yourself, that's going to be attractive to other people. People they're going to see the joy in your in your in your face. They're going to want what you have. But you know nobody nobody will follow a, a Catholic who's you know his, his faith is faith is hanging all the time. He's he's got an attitude. He's not positive. He's he doesn't look like he's in love with life and um and and love of God. But when those things are are present in a person, man, they make all the difference. So we can witness to the world through our life. And uh, so powerful story. I love that story of Fulton Sheen. And um, I'm going to get into an article now, switching gears. It's an article by an inflect, reflection by Tom Moore, a Catholic police officer. So I'm giving him uh, kudos here. It's uh, entitled I Thirst. And it, it's some reflections also on the um, on the from that journal from the the website Alicia, and they have various people, doctors, students, giving uh, a reflection on some of Jesus' last words. I saw this and I thought, man, that's that hits right here, right at home. And so uh, I'll get into uh, Thomas More's reflection here. And if he's listening, Tom, I give you kudos, man. I, I congratulate you. After this, aware that everything was now finished. In order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus says, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge, soaked it in wine, and on a sprig of hyssop, and put it up to his mouth, John 19, 28 and 29. And he says that being a police officer is dangerous work. And he says over his 15 years on the department, he found that the public, by and large, appreciates some of the danger we face he says, when I was in uniform to patrol officer, many people approached me in public places and thanked me for my work, expressing their hopes for my safety. One of my friends always tells me to wear my ballistic vest, and I know why. You know, officers could get shot, get stabbed, run over by cars. There are very real physical dangers. But I think there's another danger, he says, that faces a cop, an even greater one, the danger of thinking that physical safety and security are the greatest goods. He says that my experience tells me the greatest danger to public servants is a spiritual assault on their souls. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And he says it's, it is common for my colleagues to lose faith first in people, then in God. This often happens slowly over time. The trauma of seeing innocent children harmed and the broken nature of so many people in our communities takes a toll. The ruthless nature of modern society and its vices can make us all skeptics, but none more so than the police who see, see folks at their worst. And I would say even, especially when you work in some of these inner cities, you know, where crime is rampant, where there's a, a, a loss of, of reverence for human life, you know, just day in and day out, it could be very grueling, you know. And so I agree with what, Officer Morris saying, you know, I saw many deputies become jaded, hardened by what they, they saw day in and day out. I took to heart what St. Padre Pio said to keep me from getting jaded. And, and he, Padre Pio said, don't let the sad sight of human injustice sadden your soul. Someday you will see the unfailing justice of God triumph over it. So just when you think 
uh, you first responders that, boy, these guys are getting away with everything, man. They, they, you know, they're not serving any time, especially here in California. You know, they're getting away with it. It seems like, you know, it, it pays to be a crook. It pays to, to, uh, to steal from others, you know. No, it, it doesn't because God's justice will, will triumph in the end. That's what Padre Pio was saying. And I've seen my share of tragedy. Um, I, I can go on and on. I can probably fill up a book of, of a lot of the stories that I've seen uh, on the, the tragedies that, that uh, have, I've responded to. But anyway, he goes on. Before somehow landing in a police car with a badge, I spent some time in the seminary. So Officer Moore was discerning the priesthood. I used my training in philosophy and spirituality to, to try to strike a balance between my charitable faith and a healthy skepticism as to the motives of those I think might be committing crimes. There is a, a truth that helps interpret both the intentions of your fellow citizens and the meaning of Scripture. Actions speak louder than words. If you want to know what a speaker means, then watch what he says. And well, I'm sorry, watch what he does. He, this is what he said. So in other words, are your values what you say or what you do? That's what he's saying. Are your values what you say or what you do? Obviously, they're what you do for sure. And so here's an example. He says, I thirst. These are among the last words of Jesus just before his death and resurrection in the Gospel of John. And uh, what does he mean? Watch what he does, um, Officer Moore says. It could easily be seen as a simple physical request for a drink as he takes of the sour wine offered him. Dying for our sins at the hands of the Romans was cruel and tortured agony. Even the harsh vinegar must have been a, a blessing to a, a parched throat. So we know Jesus drank and then he died, but the gospel doesn't stop there. We go deeper, and Officer Moore goes on to say, if you want to know what a speaker means, watch what he does. So from the moment he dies, Jesus is satiating his thirst, not from the physical cup, but for the most precious of God's creation, our souls. He descends into hell. He opens the gates of heaven. He returns to his disciples to reveal the glory of the resurrection and prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit and his church. So in his actions, he clearly seeks a spiritual satiation. And uh, I hear the music, so we're going to hold that thought. We're going to come back to this and uh, finish the story. God love you. Be right back. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. In 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, St. Paul says, So there abide faith, hope, and love, these three. According to St. Ignatius of Antioch, faith is the beginning and love is the end and God is the two of them brought into unity. Then comes everything else that makes up a Christian. May God grant that we may attain all the virtues that make for authentic followers of His Son.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, where iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And uh, getting a kick out of uh, our uh, our chat line there. And I'm going over a reflection by Officer Tom Moore. And uh, he's an officer, I, I want to say in, in the Midwest, but uh, I could be wrong. I, I, I like. I don't recall exactly where he patrols, but he's, he's given his reflections on Jesus. One of the last seven things that Jesus said from the cross and his, he's talking about, I thirst. So Jesus said, he's he, officer Morse saying that, you know, you need to see what, 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 not so much what he says, but what he does after he says it. And so Jesus descends into the nether regions. Right. Um, and a lot of times we say in our, in our creed, he descended into hell. Obviously we know, that uh, it was, you know, the limbo, uh, the the dust, those the Old Testament saints that were waiting for Jesus to come and open the gates of heaven. And so, so Jesus thirsts for souls. And so it follows, Jesus must thirst for your soul. Uh, Officer Moore says, he cries out from the cross at the precious moment in time that he saves all. He cries out not in triumph or pity or anger in the at the injustice of God dying for men. He cries out in desire that all might know his mercy and rest in him. His thirst is far beyond a need for cool droughts on a dry tongue. You know, uh, we look back on Matthew twenty six twenty eight. 28, uh, when in, in the, um, in our, in the mass, when it says, for this is my blood of the new Testament, which shall be shed for many unto the remission of sins. You know, in the Latin, when we're the consecration of the precious blood, in in Latin, uh, it, it it reads "Iques inum calix sanguinis mei novi et eter testamente et mysterium fide et uh, qui pro vobus et promultus et fundator and remission in peccatorum." For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, the mystery of faith, which shall be poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, before they revised the the missal in English at the Nova Sordo. They found they found there to be many over a hundred mistakes in the Latin. So that was always one of my my. Uh, tr- it was very troubling to me when if I would attend a Novo Sordo when it was saying the faulty translation when it was saying uh, for all instead of many. You know, Jesus died for all, but not everyone would accept him. So so therefore he says for the many, and in the three synoptic gospels it says for the many. So. When they changed the words of the scripture, it was very disheartening and it, w- it was very troubling for me when at the holiest, most precious time of the mass, and, and I would I would hear a contradiction and, and it, it bothered me. And, and so for many years, I mean, that was, uh, I've been going to the Latin mass for 25 years. And so when I did attend the Nova Soto, that, that was troubling for me. Multus. Is has always meant many, and for the long time, the Nova Soto used the faulty translation, saying for all instead of many. So I'll just point that out. So Jesus talked uh, of thirst before Calvary. So back to the article, he he talked of thirst before Calvary. His teaching during the Sermon on the Mount gave all of us the worthy mission to hunger and thirst for righteousness, so we can be satisfied. And so, is it any surprise that Jesus reveals to us on the cross that he has a deep spiritual thirst? What could be more righteous on God's part than to be so passionately, to, to so passionately yearn for us to return to Him? You know, as uh, one of the greatest tragedies in in um, salvation is is for God to lose a soul. You know, one who, to lose his soul because you're a child of God. That's the biggest tragedy of all. 
So he goes on in the article, it says, As a police officer, I strive to thirst for righteousness for the sake of those I serve. I have learned to serve the spiritual needs of those I meet, not just the physical. I try to take the time to listen to the broken and marginalized members of Christ's body. I look for opportunities where a kind word of encouragement and mercy could bring peace rather than a cold legal consequence. Hmm. When I, Even when I must arrest someone, I, I act justly and remember that no one is evil, even though we are capable of great evil. Jesus thirsts for the souls of the burglar, the robber, and even the pimp, just as he does for the policeman's soul. I strive to be like Christ and pray for those I pursue. My prayer this tritium is that we might give our souls to Jesus on the cross, that he might be satisfied. His physical thirst was met with a bitter hyssop. His spiritual thirst remains. Through God's grace and the ministry of his church, I pray that you and I will let him drink deeply of our souls this very week. What a great takeaway from uh, Officer Moore. So, man, we, we need more first responders like this. We all need to be preaching Christ crucified. We all need to be uh, striving for righteousness sake and, and uh, to serve others. But, uh, but how much... How cool is that to have a, a a man in uniform to be after God's own heart to to put Christ first to be out there, you know this. this if, if if all our first responders were you know they worship God they give God their first love you know they made Him the priority. Uh, you wouldn't hear about negative stories of, of police officers that that tarnish the badge. I try to do much like uh, Officer Moore. I prayed for those that I that I arrested. I counseled those on the street daily. Um, I remember a story, and um, I'm probably in the show with this. Uh, there's a story of a a gang shooting that uh, that uh, I re- responded to. Um, one guy was he was sandwiched in a, on a left turn lane by a rival gang, and and they walked up to his his uh, window and executed him, you know, in broad daylight. And, uh, you know, uh, one of my, uh, friends at the station, he grew up in that area and, uh, that was, that was his cousin who was killed. He became a deputy. His cousin became a gang member and, uh, it was pretty moving. Um, I was working the gang enforcement team and I was, we were out looking for the victim's brother because the victim, um, the victim had been shot at prior to being killed and his older brother tried to avenge that and went for payback to this rival gang. And he landed himself in prison for, for that. And when he got out, this happened to his little brother. And so uh, the word on the street and through our informants, we were, we were getting word that this, this shot caller, he was, he was actually leader of that, that gang, and I'm not going to mention any names of the gang, and uh, but it was a it was the largest gang at the uh, at that time in East LA, and so we knew that he tried to avenge his brother's shooting prior. This is good information, good intel that we we needed to find the shot caller before he found he made uh, retribution for his brother's death. That he, you know, he was looking to avenge his brother's death. So we went out of We were just hitting location after location, trying to find him. Just always one step behind him. And um, at one point, we got good intelligence that he was he had he had went east to a suburb, and uh, it was my case. You know, we ended up uh, going back there and and. Setting up on a house, our SWAT team came in and served a, a warrant, and uh, they they got him out, and uh, they they've got an assault rifle out of the attic. So he went he went peacefully, um, but it could have been could have been awful because he had uh, you know an AK forty seven assault rifle. And as he was brought to the radio car, uh, he was brought to my car because it was my case. I walked him out, and I sat him in the car. And, you know, the first thing out of my mouth wasn't, you know, you know, why are you, why you're a parolee? Why are you possessing an assault rifle? No, rather I was, 
I, I showed my humanity by by telling him how sorry I was for the loss of his brother. I, I told him that I that I was friends with his cousin, a fellow deputy. Um, I told him that uh, you know, look to the cross. You know, um, Jesus died; he didn't deserve it. Your brother didn't deserve to die like this, but neither did Jesus. So I encouraged him to 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 seek our blessed mother because she's going to give him consolation. She's going to give him. Uh, she's going to console him because she was consoling St. John and, and Mary Magdalene at the cross. And, and she knows what it's like to lose a loved one. And so I shared that with him and you could see the tears rolling down his cheeks. He couldn't believe that. First of all, that a, a guy from the gang team was telling him all these things. And I said, you know, the, the greatest thing you can do for your brother is to get out of the gang, to turn your life around, to make something of your life. Okay. This isn't the end of the world. Had he, avenge his brother's death then he'd be looking at a life sentence you know you know or maybe even the death penalty depending on you know the circumstances but so he, he was just there just crying you know and this is the hardened gang member a, a parolee a shot caller in the gang and um just as, as so as people started coming i just told him hey i give him a moment get yourself together because you know they can't they can't be showing tears when they they get go to jail that's a sign of weakness and so I didn't want him to lose credibility, and I, I, I just gave him that opportunity to, you know, to, to treat him like a man, and and um, he appreciated that. And you know, um, months later, I, I come to find out that he was jumped out of the gang, that he, he may have taken to heart what I said to him, that he need to walk away from this lifestyle. There's no future in this lifestyle, and he, and he turned his, uh, well, I don't know uh, what became of him but i do know i saw pictures from the jail of his his face you know pretty beat up because to to get out of a gang you've got to be jumped out you got to be we call well they call courted out they get jumped in they got to get jumped out you know blood in blood out you remember that movie and that's exactly what happened so i saw the pictures that were relayed to us back at the the gang unit from from the jail where he he suffered that uh the pummeling but it just goes to show you that you can make a difference in someone's life. You treat people the way you want to be treated. You, you, you talk to them about God. You carry yourself in such a way that they know where you stand, that you have an ideal, that you stand for something. And uh, people are going to take you more serious. They're going to say, man, I want what this guy has. You know, I, I rarely had it, trouble with people that I... Because I connected with them, you know, on a human level, on a, on a supernatural level. And, um, yeah, that's what, that, that's what we got to do, you know, especially during this Lenten season. Let's go out of our way to be better, to be better Catholics, be better disciples. You know, we sometimes we wonder why we, we, people judge us in the Catholic Church. They judge people by who aren't practicing their faith. They need to look at those that are practicing their faith to base what the church teaches me. so that's the wrap that's uh i'm going 10 7 stay tuned for hands-on apologetics with gary mishuda you've been listening to jesus 911 keep the faith i'm out saint faustina's prayer for priests oh my jesus i beg thee on behalf of the whole church grant it love and the light of thy spirit and give power to the words of priests so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to Thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou Thyself maintain them in holiness. O Divine and Great High Priest, may the power of Thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of Thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us. Virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity.